It's Subverted Tropes, a podcast about movies, featuring your hosts, Daniel Spencer and Kate Harlow. Welcome to another episode of Subverted Tropes. I'm Dan. I'm Kate. And today we're going to be talking about Manos, the Hands of Fate. Guys, I'm so excited. So, Kate, I've got a question for you. Yes, love. What is the strangest thing you've ever done on a bet? Um, I I once ordered uh, a Sunday in a Denny's without using any words, just gibberish and pointing to the menu. Nice. I think the strangest thing I've ever done on a bet was, I mean, for losing a bet, I had to play disc golf with a series of discs that may not have actually been disc golf discs. That was glorious. It was really great. And it included a floppy disc, a CD-ROM, an actual like floppy, floppy disc. And hot lava. And hot lava. A terribly weighted, just terrible, terrible plastic, frightening mess. It's not, it, it wasn't even like a good, like just for kids to throw at each other frisbee. Like it just shouldn't have been a frisbee. It was a lump of plastic in the shape of a frisbee. It's terrible, but I, I carry it around in my disc golf bag anyway. Hot lava. Top speed. This movie was made on a bet. I am not surprised. In the 60s, Harold P. Warren was active in the theater community of El Paso, Texas. He was a father, a husband, an author, a screenwriter, an inventor. He sounds like an oil investor. That name sounds like a... Harold P. Warren. He's an oil man. I'm investing in snake oil. I take a snake and I squeeze it until oil comes out of it. And then I will lubricate your jalopy. He watched his kids one day on the inventor side of this. This is one of my favorite things. He was watching his kids playing with Legos, as you do. What twisted son of a bitch wouldn't play along? I know. That's the the creative, creative mind of Harold P. Warren, also known as Hal Warren. He decided, man, these are really good for building. What if we made giant cement versions of them? and actually built houses with giant cement Legos. I feel like you're expecting to be impressed, and I'm not. We'll call them super blocks. Super blocks didn't take off. He could have just been playing with the Legos with his kids. So, he wasn't actually a professional in the theater scene. That might surprise you. He wasn't a professional inventor. Even though super blocks, you know. Um, was he a professional at anything? Yes, he was a professional shit salesman. He sold manure. So he was doing acting and stuff on the side. And he actually got a walk-on role in the TV show Route 66. Because of that role, he got to meet screenwriter Sterling Siliphant. That sounds like a medication... I'm going to need you to apply Sterling Siliphant three times a day on the affected area and three inches out from the affected area (laughs) in all directions. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that sounds about right. So Sterling Siliphant had written for several TV shows, um, Route 66 primarily, but also Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Ooh. Somehow... So you're telling me that this, what what will become Manos, could have been a Hitchcock production? I guess maybe, tangentially? Tangentially. Siliphant has no, he does not do any work on this movie. You just wanted to say his name? No, we'll get there. Okay, I'm sorry. I derailed it. Keep going. Somehow he convinced Siliphant to have a cup of coffee with him. And in their conversation, he talked about how it's not that tough to make a horror movie. Sullivan said that? No, I'm sorry. Hal Warren. Hal Warren, who has no experience doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I see what's going to happen now. He bet, Sullivan, that he could make a movie, a horror movie, 
all by himself. And Silliphant was like, sir, I just, I just came here to drink my coffee and you sat down and started talking to me. I don't know. Who are you? Pretty much. <laughs> Silliphant took him up on the bed. If it means that you'll leave this table, yes, I, I accept. I accept. I don't want to shake your hand. No, it's a, I, no, no, I promise. I, I'm taking the bet. Oh, please let go of my hand. Warren began writing down ideas for the movie on the napkin he was using. He was so excited to do this. Everybody knows napkin ideas are the best ideas. Yeah. I mean, J.K. Rowling will tell you. She, to be fair, she didn't own any paper. I mean, that's fair. Maybe Warren didn't either. No, uh, apparently he was a very good salesman. He was an inventor. He had to have paper. You need paper to invent. He somehow scraped together $19,000 to make this movie. Poop money. It's about $142,000 in today's money. Poop Poop money. money. So he hired a bunch of local actors. Uh, He called a modeling agency and got some models. So he had to find ways to cut costs because he had so little money for the picture. So instead of a salary, he promised the cast and the crew shares the profits. In this case, I don't feel like that was a good idea. It's starting to sound a little similar to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, isn't it? It is, but actually not, wait. A little bit different. A little bit different? This time, everyone was offered ownership shares. Tom Neiman, Neyman, I don't know, N-E-Y-M-A-N. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. I'm just going to go with Neyman. Okay. Tom Neyman and his wife made the sets, the costumes, the props. They designed and made them all themselves. Neyman was a good friend of Warren and stars in the movie. I I was going to say, I hesitate to say that's impressive. It's that sure done was a lot of work. Sure done was a lot of work. And when you see, I think the master's poncho is impressive. Boy, that sure is a poncho. That sure is a poncho. Something I say at least once a year. (laughs) Now, I'm not sure. Have you seen this before? I have. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, you know... That poncho. Exactly, which is why it is. As I say, I don't say that's impressive. Correct. <laughs> I say that sure done was a lot of work. That's fair. Naaman's daughter and dog are also in this movie. And they were the only actors to actually get paid. The dog got a whole bunch of dog food. And Naaman's daughter got a bike. Good honor. This film also had a couple of other working titles. Lay them on me. The Lodge of Sins. (laughs) Fingers of Fate. (laughs) I mean, that's all I got. Then they went to Monos, the Hands of Fate, which of course translates into Hands, the Hands of Fate. It's just so good. It's so bad. It's so... Also, I just want to... I just want to throw out there. I was Skyping earlier, and uh, my mother saw your sombrero in the background and asked what's the deal with the sombrero and I told her um, and then she said oh I thought Dan was going to wear it because monos that's she's wonderful she's a lovely lady I said I'll suggest it and she said no it was my idea I love it (laughs) so the filming took place in El Paso on a ranch owned by Based off his name, clearly a supervillain, Colbert Coldwell. Also an oil man? <laughs> also probably an oil man. An oil man supervillain. I'm going to get all of the oil and nobody else will have any oil and it'll all be very cold. They'll be well and cold. This town's going to be, that, that, that oil well's going to be dry. <laughs> and I've learned to control the snakes. They only give oil to me now. Come here, snake. I'm Mr. Coldwell. I'm going to milk out your oil. (laughs) (laughs) Milk out your oil is awful. Yep. (laughs) All of the equipment that they used was rented. 
So they had to shoot very quickly so that it did not use up more money. <laughs> Which made it very difficult considering the 16 millimeter camera that they used. Oh boy. It was hand wound. Oh no. They could shoot a maximum of 32 seconds per scene. Like at a time. 32 seconds, wind. 32 seconds, wind. 32 seconds, wind. Holy goodness. It's like making a movie entirely out of vines. Yes, it is. We should do that. Let's not. And we could... Oh, here's what we do. We make a movie entirely out of vines. Mm -hmm. Set it at Martha's Vineyard. Name it Vineyard Vines. No, that's a terrible idea, isn't it? Yeah, it's a terrible idea. Okay, well, moving on. It's a good name, but uh, it's not going to happen. So, Naaman's daughter, Jackie. Mm -hmm. She has written a book about her experience with this movie. Mm -hmm. And she talks about her family's enthusiasm for the movie. Even though they knew it was bad. Here's what she said. You have to understand that Hal's quite the salesman. So they jumped at the opportunity. Hal never pushed it as a great movie. He said from the beginning that he was making a B-movie. But he thought it was going to open doors for future film projects, so everyone stuck it out, hoping it would lead to something better. She was so embarrassed of her lines that she'd say them quietly and ask if they needed to be redone. Warren would just say, we'll fix it in the lab. This was a common phrase for Warren during shooting. What lab? We'll fix it in the lab. I think his lab... I don't think they had a lab. Or if they did, it was broken... Or maybe it was a Labrador. There was no lab. We'll fix it in the golden lab. Retriever. The lab work came in the form of doing all the sound effects in post. And redubbing all of the voices in post. With only Beautiful. a handful of the actors. It wasn't even the full cast. Oh, of course it wasn't. So most of the voices are like... I mean, all of the voices are just like four or five of the actual actors in the movie. Oh, man. It's so good, you guys. That's an interesting word to use. I mean, I say good. It's good is not the word. This is a steaming pile of crap. But I have so much nostalgia for it. He does sell it really well because he's used to selling steaming piles of crap. Yeah, but I, 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 he doesn't get the credit for it. This is, this is an, this is a mystery science classic. This is, I, this is the, yeah. this is my bread and butter. Like other kids, they watched The Price Is Right when they were homesick from school. I watched the Sci Fi Channel. Like I watched old episodes of The Twilight Zone. Whatever mystery science came on, even if I had seen it ten times, I watched it again. I would get up early on Saturdays and go turn on. Uh, either sci-fi or Comedy Central, and watch Mystery Science Theater 3000. I loved yes. it as a kid. I mean, that, I, I would put on Comedy Central, and that's when they would run Clue, like, eight times in a row, like, with no explanation for why it was that they were showing the same movie over and over and over again. Like, that was my childhood. So, I know everybody else gets really excited about Plinko. I get really excited about Manos. I think that's fair. The first time I watched Manos, I was... Um, it was short, shortly after I graduated um, from high school. I started watching it, and my sister sent me a text saying, hey, come hang out with, uh, with our high school friends who all went to NC State together. So I paused it, went and hung out with them, and was on my way home when I got my first ever speeding ticket. Which was funny because my sister had given me a hard time about how slow I drive when I was leaving from NC State. I'll show her. And then I got home in a terrible mood and finished Manos the Hands of Fate. And then three days later, I totaled that car. No. Oh. To be fair, I didn't total the car. The car got totaled. It was a, there was a blind turn and it was a mess. My parents were away in Disney World that whole week. I'm like, oh, hey, I totaled the car and I got a speeding ticket, but it's not as big a deal because I totaled the car. None of this is an exaggeration either. No, this is all real. <laughs> so Diana Marie plays Margaret, the wife. Warren really wanted to have a big name in that role, but obviously couldn't afford it. 
so he decided to make Marie a big name. He submi- submitted her to the... Submitted? He submitted. That sounds dirty. He submitted her to the regional West Texas beauty pageant and didn't tell her until she was accepted. And then he's like, oh, hey. No. You're in this beauty pageant. No. And she made it to the finals. In one scene, he did try and get her to go topless. She said no. Good for her. And he's like, oh, it was just a test anyway. Which is, I mean, bullshit. She didn't do it. She refused to. Good for her. We as a country have a long way to go. We're working on it. Joyce Muller Mm -hmm. was one of the models to appear as one of the master's wives. But she broke her foot at the beginning of filming. For some reason, Warren really wanted to have her in the movie. So the infamous completely not tied to the rest of the movie couple in the car making out, that's Joyce Miller. He wanted her for her singing voice. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. (laughs) Lovely singing voice. Mm -hmm. That scene also has the very famous clapboard that you can see the... All right, and action clapboard uh, at the beginning of that scene. Oh, God bless. It's just so great. It's so great. So great. And there's more stuff that we'll talk about, but I think it's better stuff to talk about after we've seen it and refreshed our memories because it's been a while since I've seen it. So. Yeah, no, it's been a while. And we did specially get the just the plain version. The non MST three K version. Yeah. We yeah. have this now on Blu ray. Yes. If that makes you think that there's something wrong with us. You're wrong. And I don't want to drive with you. Let's go watch this movie. And we're back. Guys, it hasn't gotten any better since the last time we watched it. It hasn't. It's not just, even a little. It's terrible. Uh, if anything, I noticed uh, I noticed or I thought about things that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> like the thing um with Torgo running off. Like yeah. it so so Torgo, spoiler, they're they're going to kill him, they're gonna sacrifice him, he has done poor he has done poorly, he has let everybody down. Uh they they slap about his face meat for a while, and then the master takes his hand over to the burning hand effigy and touches his finger to it and he like he explodes, his hand is removed from his body and is on fire, and then you kind of see him like flaily run off into the background with one of his the arm that had the hand on it uh, that that's now missing shooting fire yes and i always took that to mean that like okay well i i guess, i guess now that he he's missing one of his manos i guess he's just he's just no good to them anymore i guess that's his punishment and he's done but then they say like well now that torgo's been destroyed or like the language of it and the language leading up to it makes it seem and sound like he is dead has been killed is de- did they really was he not supposed to be there? Were we not supposed to notice that? I think he was supposed to be there. We were supposed to see that. Otherwise, why would they have added in the fire effect? I don't... But also... I would not put it past them to add a fire effect on something... <laughs> that didn't that, need it? That, that we weren't supposed to see? Well, not even, that we weren't supposed to see, that they just didn't think it through. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Did they not think it through, is my, is he my question. He went off into the desert to die like a cactus person. That's what happens, right? You go out into the desert and you die, and that's when you turn into a cactus, and that's why I look like people. I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's, yep, that's yep, what yep. happens. Yep, that's mm-hmm. what I learned in um, when I was reading Holes 2, The Secret of Cactus the Camp. Cactus Boogaloo. Cactus Boogaloo. Anytime you say anything to and don't expect me to follow it up with Boogaloo, you're wrong. <laughs> I know, I know. At least you still want to drive with me. That's only so I can educate you about why Boogaloo is always the follow-up. Oh, break into <laughs> electric boogaloo. boogaloo. So, let's talk about Torgo. Tell me about Torgo. So, John Reynolds is the actor who played Torgo. Mm-hmm. He was on drugs for pretty much all of the filming. 
again, this is not something I find surprising. I am not surprised. But let's talk about that weird walk of his and his legs. Okay, and again, that's something, they dropped it after like two scenes. He had excellent traveling music. If they just played his music every time he was walking, that would have, I'm not saying it would have made it a good movie, but it would have upped the value, in my opinion. Definitely. So, the character of Torgo Mm -hmm. is a satyr. Okay. All right. That, uh, okay. He wore his haunches backwards. And no one ever corrected him. It would have looked a lot more like a satyr if he'd worn his haunches the right way. They also never explain that he's a satyr in the movie. They don't mention it at all. No, it, it doesn't come up at all. He's just got really beefy kind of bow legs. <laughs> His, he's got beefy thighs. Yes. Pointy knees. Yes. And he was supposed to have fake hooves, but they never made them. So they just gave him boots. They were too busy working on that poncho. <laughs> Oh, that poncho. <laughs> we should get that whole, that poncho its own villa. I... It'll be poncho villa. I'm taking that joke out. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to. I want. I kind of want to see that poncho. Like, I want that next Christmas season as like a fleece throw on Think Geek. I'm going to do everything I can to make that happen for you. I would buy that. Because I love you. I would buy that. Come on. It would pull this room together. It would look amazing. It would. It's Hurricane's color. Let's talk about the premiere of this movie. Was it a star-studded event? It was. At least Warren really wanted it to be. I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, So writer, director, producer Hal Warren. Mm Mm-hmm was also the star of the film. He plays Michael. Yes. So he is a quadruple threat. Devastating effect, by which I mean I was devastated to watch him. His performance moved me to tears. 70 minutes of nonstop crying. 70 minutes? It's only 70 minutes, but it feels like 150. Whew. It just drags and drags. And, and drags. drags. So, the premiere. Capri Theater in El Paso agreed to actually like debut it as a as a premiere. Did they see it first? No. Oh, they invited a bunch of local celebrities and they showed up. God bless them. It was a big to-do. Great thing is that the event, all of the proceeds from it went to benefit a local uh, cerebral palsy charity good which is very good very good warren worked with local car dealerships to get searchlights gosh because if there's one thing if there's one thing that warren is good at it's showmanship yeah yeah he wanted all of his stars to arrive in limos but of course they didn't have limos what did they show up in Well, he told them all, park like a block and a half away. He rented a limousine. And dropped them off one at a time? One at a time. Oh my God. And then the limousine would go around the corner, pick them up, pick one up, and then go back around the other way and drop off the next star. I don't even have words. This is amazing. It's dedication. It, it's impressive. It is It is something else. I went to a premiere mm-hmm. of uh, a movie I was in. Mm-hmm. I believe we've talked about it in prior episodes. Mm-hmm. Suburban Nights. And it was at the Rialto in downtown Raleigh. It was fantastic. It was a great event. We all showed up in cars and wore normal clothing. Everyone there was dressed in evening gowns and tuxedos. He really wanted it to be a Hollywood affair. I forgot to ask, what did he bet? 
I looked and looked and, and looked. And there was no answer on I that? I could not find okay. what that bet was. It, I mean, it, maybe it was a leave me alone bet. I'm just bring, I'm I'm building on on my theory that he wasn't actually invited to have coffee. <laughs> uh, you you could be very right there. Some of the actors and the crew mm-hmm. snuck out of the theater because the audience started actively heckling it. <laughs> so a lot of them left during the premiere so that they wouldn't have to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, ma'am. Weren't you one of the wives in oh, that, uh, in uh, that Manos movie? No, no, uh, no. I remember seeing you. You were the mm. one saying that you were the oldest wife, and you didn't think no, they should kill you, a kid. You have me confused. Uh, your wife is in uh, is in my uh, jazzer size class. Oh, that plus you don't sound anything like that woman. No. So I'm just I'm just mistaken. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm going to leave. Y'all have a good night now. Say say hello to your wife, Pat. I will let Pat know. Thank you. It was just an incredible affair. A real night to remember, I, I bet. The movie saw some distribution. Uh... Around El Paso and at drive-ins across West Texas and into New Mexico. I have an idea. Yeah. There's this movie, yep. and there's got a whole bunch of um. It's just a it's just a, a boy and a girl in a car, uh, making out. All right. Let's show it at the the makeout field. Oh yeah, is it that Manos movie? Yeah, that one. Yeah, I the, like that idea. The, you know that you know that uh, the, what did they they get so mad at me? The drive-in theater. Yeah, that's right. The makeout field. Yes. Yeah. Let's. But it's just, it's what they're there for. It's what they're there for. Everyone's going to be making out. I know I do. Yep. You and me, Paul, we're going to be making out. Yep. Let's make out now. (laughs) So, let's talk about the tropes of this movie. Because Uh, it's pretty much filled with It's literally, it's just made out of them. Family gets lost and winds up at bad place. Creepy caretaker is creepy and lecherous. Creepy and lecherous. Uh, tries to be harbinger. To no avail. To no avail. You guys might want to leave, but you can't leave. But you should you should not stay because the master won't like it. But you can't go anywhere. But don't you should stay, stay the here. night though. <laughs> master kills servant. Master kills servant. Master has multiple wives. Multiple wives fight amongst selves. There's that very famous trope of Master wears a giant red, uh, giant poncho with red, big red hands on it. That's my favorite trope of all. It's a really good trope. I think it worked really well in Hellboy. <laughs> Cops are inept. Cops are inept. Uh, let's see. Child keeps wandering off. Uh, child is voiced by a much older person doing a child's voice. Oh, I hate that so much. It's I so hate creepy. It's, done. it's so terribly done every oh, time. God, so bad, so bad. Um, the pet, the animal is the first to die. Yeah. That poor poodle. It didn't deserve to be in that movie. It didn't. Um, oh, uh, uh, a creepy evil person has unsettling painting of themselves. The end, question mark? Oh, yeah, the end question mark, without a doubt, is when I was a kid... That's a threat. That's a threat. That is exactly it. When I was a kid, that was one of, honestly, I loved when movies did that. I don't know why, but I just loved it. I'm like, oh, that's such a great, fresh take. Maybe it's not the end. In Flash Gordon, (laughs) when the wind is blowing over the ring and you hear Ming the Merciless's laugh and the... (laughs) As the question mark shows up, loved it. All about it. (laughs) Give me some more Timothy Dalton, please. Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, yeah, Timothy Dalton. And Brian Blessed. Oh, Brian Blessed all day, every day. (laughs) Hawkman? Dive! I leaned back from the mic because I knew that I was going to be loud with that, and I still wasn't as loud as I wanted it to be. It was still pretty loud. And those waves are high. <laughs> Not surprise ending, but like, yeah, the the, like, the it's like it's like a, a misdirect ending. 
yeah, the dark ending. Dark ending. Of they didn't escape. They didn't escape. The bad guys win. Mm-hmm. And whatever happened to Torgo? Whatever happened to Torgo? He's he, a cactus He's now. a cactus. But only has, like, he, he's got one arm pointing up and one arm, like, most, like, three-fourths of an arm that's pointing down. But on the 4th of July, it shoots sparks. That's right. It should be the other way around then. The three parts of the arm should be up. <laughs> yes. So they can shoot out sparks. You don't want to catch the desert on fire. That'd be dangerous. Yeah, it would be dangerous. It's very dry. One thing that I noticed, and it's probably just because we just watched it last night, but the similarities between this and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, my goodness. Are yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Don't come into this house. I'm going to come right on in. This house is dangerous. I, no, I'm just going to come in. We find the house in the daytime, and then everything goes to shit, and we end at the nighttime. Mm-hmm. I think I'd like to leave now. No, you can't. But you told me I couldn't come in. Now you're staying. The actors weren't really paid. Yeah, actors weren't paid. Or at uh, least were offered ownership shares instead. Which means not paid. It was made by someone who didn't really have a lot of experience. Two very different results. Two very different results. Both shot on 16 millimeter. Although the one that Toby Hooper used wasn't a hand crank. Jesus God, that's the other thing. That's the other thing that I didn't, I didn't know about the, what, 32, 32, 32. seconds? 32 seconds. When you're filming in 32 seconds and you're not entirely sure of whether or not you're getting all of your plot points, it leads to a lot of repetition. So I don't know how much of that was written into the script and how much of that was, I don't know if we said that and we got it on the last 32 seconds, so just start over again. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. The it's, amount of repetition from one shot to another. You can hear whether like they some of it's bad acting, some of it's just, I'm sorry. yeah, some of it's just terrible acting, and some of it's mismanagement of shoots, and some of it's the fact that this movie should not have been made. Yeah, yeah, it did get made, and so technically Warren won his bet. I I wish we knew what he actually won. Self satisfaction, maybe. I guess a cup of coffee. I feel like he got to keep bothering him. <laughs> No, I feel I feel like the wise choice would have been like, yeah, buddy, uh, I bet you. Now I'm gonna get far away from you. Silphant <laughs> was like, "Come find me." Yeah, Silphant was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." Call me when you're in town. No, no, no you can just find my number. It's easy. Yeah, look, look it up. My name is spelled uh, G E O R G E L U C A S. Uh, yep, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, Hal Warren was actually the real inspiration for Star Wars. Well, well. Hal Warren, writer, director, producer, star of this film, called up George Lucas and told him an idea and was the real inspiration for Star Wars. Go on. I really can't. I don't think I can make up much more. You. I was trying to get you... I realized it just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I think that's about all that I have. Okay. That's another Any episode. wrap up ideas you'd like to? Um, I highly encourage you to see this. Even if you've, even if the only thing you can find is the mystery science theater 3000 version, see it. They rip it so well. They, they rip it so well. They do a really good job of what they do and you should experience it best to do with a whole bunch of your friends. This is another one of those movies that there, I mean, there is no redeeming quality to it. There is nothing about it that you're going to be like, oh, wow, well, that shot was really well framed. Or that, I mean, literally, there are parts of it that the camera's not even focused. It's not a good movie. But it's fun. It's fun. With your friends and some alcohol. Yes. Please drink responsibly. If you drink, if you don't drink, that's fine. You don't have to drink for it to be fun. Of course. No, it's still very fun. But experience it. It's, it is worth experiencing. And I am here to issue a bet to anyone who thinks they can make a horror movie on $19,000. You go ahead and you do that and you send it to us. At subvertedtropecast at gmail.com. And if you've done it, especially if you get it to premiere in a theater, then you'll win the bet 
and you don't have to leave us alone. Wait, hold on. No, I don't like where this is going. I don't I don't like where this is going. You win the bet and you You will get a a a kudos and an official call out. And some subverted tropes merch as soon as we have some. We will make to, some merch. The, we'll make the merch specifically for you and then sell it. Well, no, no, no. We'll have we'll have merch in general, but I we will make I will cross stitch you some manner of good job. You made a movie thing that that will be that will be your reward. So if you're into poorly done cross stitch and taking bets based on podcasts, you go get them. I will record a video specifically congratulating you. There you go. That's your reward. That's that's all. That's what you get. So again, that Gmail is subvertedtropecast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Subverted Tropes. You can also check out our blog where we post about uh, our content sources, where we find all our research and other stuff like pictures of our adorable cat and sound producer Ripley at subvertedtropecast.wordpress.com. And as always, a big shout out and lots of thanks to the wonderful human who created our logo. Her name is Gracie and you can find her on Instagram at a fandom doodler. Her Etsy shop is the that crazy princess and she does beautiful work and she's super sweet and super fun to work with. So go check her out. And incredibly talented. Yeah, that too. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and rate us. You can find us on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and YouTube. That's right. So thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next time. Torgo.